It is game week. I sit down with Coach Don Patterson as we talk about Iowa football 2023 edition, the season ahead, including an early look at Utah State, plus his thoughts on the depth chart, key analytics to performing well in the Big Ten Conference this season, and what is Don's take on the waist down conversation I had with Brian Ferentz back at Media Day. All that and much more during an hour plus long season preview show with the one and only coach Don Patterson coming up during week 225 of Brada's branded thoughts right here from the Hawkeye of the storm. But first want to thank our sponsor, Iowa floor covering, check out this beautiful showroom, this beautiful building down in Bondurant, Iowa floor covering their headquarters right in the heart of central Iowa. Be sure to visit them online iowafloorcovering.com slash DIY. Check out their tough cork click together 4.5 millimeter waterproof vinyl flooring available at just $269 with self-installation or you can call them by means of the number on the screen. Again, it's iowafloorcovering.com slash DIY. We appreciate Ryan, Tyler, and the guys for sponsoring yet another year of Iowa football coverage right here at from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Thank you to Iowa Floor Covering. We'd like to welcome everybody to a special edition of Brad's Branded Thoughts here at From the Hawkeye of the Storm. It's our season preview with the one and only Coach Don Patterson. I'm Corey Brady, your host. We're talking Iowa football 2023. We're recording this Monday, August 28th. And Don, this, this next hour is going to be the best hour of your life because we're going to be talking about another football season ahead. So uh, all joking aside, I know you've been putting a lot of work into analytics as you always do. You're open about that on, on our show. And um, uh, just first of all, talk a little bit about what the last couple of months have been like for you from a football standpoint. You, you were retired, but you're still very much involved with, um, like I said, analytical work as it relates to the Big Ten Conference and Iowa football. Talk about what the last two months have been like for you. Well, I lose track of time, Corey, but I'm guessing maybe the middle of June, I started working um, on a daily basis on analytics. There, there was a lot to catch up on. I had charted all the games last fall in terms of who won the parameter, who won the game, but you still got to go back and compile all of that and put it all in good format so that it is understandable to the players and coaches. So long story short, I put in some pretty long work days there in late June, early July, and in, in the late July even, with the goal being to finish it off before we went on our vacation. And as you know, we went to the Finger Lakes uh, a couple of weeks ago and and um, had a wonderful break. But I, I was able to give Kirk a final copy of those analytics before I left town, and we didn't share it with anybody else. And then, as you know, when we got back into town, Kirk had said, uh, let's get together when you get back. And so we did that last Thursday. And um, uh, I think Kirk was appreciative of the information. I think he knew I was dead serious when I said, I don't think we've had ever more informative analytics than what we have this year. And we can talk about that as we go. But, and the only cautionary note I gave him is the only thing that makes me a little bit nervous, they may not hold up as well as they typically do, if only because of the NIL and the transfer portal and um, not to mention any number of coaching changes. So uh, I did promise him as soon as I know that those, those tendencies are not holding up, you'll be the first to know. And as you know, we chart that on a weekly basis. And if those tendencies are not holding up anymore, we'll know it in the early stages of the season. And then we'll, we'll adjust accordingly, of course. So talk to us, Don, about why you made that comment to Kirk here a few days ago that, that you believe um, the analytics are as important as they've been. What what did you see in the data that made you feel that way? Well, uh, the things I can talk about to the general public, as you know, Corey, I evaluate 25 different parameters in all 64 games. And um, a year earlier, in other words, last summer, as I was looking at the fall of 21, we had 15 parameters that were 70% winning percentage or higher. This year, that number went from 15 to 17. So you had 17 parameters that were 70% all the way up to 83%. Um, and as a result of that, I figured this year, uh, all combinations involving those 17 parameters, there's 136 different combinations to go through. And you got to go through all 64 games on each of those 
136 combinations, so it's tedious work. Uh, but the amazing thing in my mind, that one year earlier, Corey, we had one combination that was 100% win. This year we had eight combinations that were each 100% win. I thought that was significant. And as a result of all that, I was able to put together a prediction model now this summer involving uh, five parameters. I don't mind saying that number. It's the five parameter model I've gone with, but they're failing to come up with a good three or four parameter model. The five parameter model, as I mentioned to you before, uh, most regular when you applied that model to all 64 games, uh, the record was 58 wins and no losses. 100% win on 58 games. That left six ties. It's typical to have a few ties in there. There's no way you're going to get rid of them because the simple question I ask is, who won the parameter, who won the game? And, of course, there are five parameters. If none of them are ties, then clearly somebody wins, right? It's either three to two, four to one, or five to nothing. If it's five to nothing, it's probably a 40, 50-point spread in the game. But so many games in the Big Ten are three to two. And it really doesn't really matter too much which three you win. You just need to win three out of five. You probably win the game. Matter of fact, last season says you win the game every time. Uh, we realize that might not hold up this year. But to kind of put it to the test, one summer ago, Corey, as you know, I had a four-parameter model that predicted a record of 56 wins and three losses based on the previous season. I went back and looked, what was the record last fall when you applied last summer's Prediction model. Prediction was 56 and three. The final record at the end of the year, 56 and four. So that's a pretty good prediction model if it was one game off. And I'm hoping this year's model, of course, holds up and it, it proves to be 100% reliable, not just last season, but the upcoming season as well. So talk about how that affects, now I'm not talking about Kirk specifically, but you've worked with, I was not the only team you've worked with provided analytics to in the past this is something that you are obviously very skilled at and i'm just curious how does this affect a head coach's game planning well i think he realizes uh, first off the best way the best chance you have to win three out of those five parameters it sounds simple but it's true the elementary fact is you have a better chance of winning them if you know what they are uh, i know that only makes some sense but Let's face it, I think we're the only team in the Big Ten that knows what those five parameters are. And I did tell Kirk as I gave it to him, I said, Kirk, there's three of us that know what these five parameters are. It's you, it's me, and it's Lisa. And Lisa knows only because she typed it. And to be honest with you, I'm sure she's already forgotten what they are. So I think we're down to you and I. Uh, now, the staff does have that information, of course, is going to be shared with the staff. And, and at some point, at Kirk's decision-making, process is going to be shared with the players and i'm sure the players are going to understand do not share this with your girlfriend with your mom or dad with your old high school coach do not share this with anyone because this is vital information that the other team simply doesn't have and that gives us the best chance to win the three out of five is to know what those five parameters are so let's talk about a couple and i'm not asking you which parameters you know i know you're not going to divulge which parameters fall into those categories ton but I do want to ask you about two specific parameters that I know from our past discussions have been incredibly important as it relates. And we're talking specifically about Big Ten football, right? Iowa, of course, That's opens right. with three non-conference games. One of the more polarizing stats when you look at Iowa football year in and year out is explosive plays. You look at what Phil Parker does with that unit in limiting explosive plays. And a couple of years ago, they were maybe slightly above average or right around average, which is kind of an outlier for for a Phil Parker coached unit 2020, they were phenomenal last year. They were phenomenal. And then you look at the offensive side of the football. And that's one of the, the many complaints from the fan base uh, is that Iowa doesn't generate enough, enough explosive plays. And, and obviously uh, big plays through the air downfield. Just talk about what that does. Where does Iowa stand as it relates to explosive play margin? Because I know it's been an important stat in determining uh, win loss outcome in the past. Yeah, based on last season, Corey, this is one of the one of the um, the biggest separations we have between offensive and defensive performance, as you mentioned already. Um, and I don't mind sharing these numbers because someone that did the research could come up with the numbers, and it's no secret that we're one of the best teams 
in the conference at preventing big plays on de- defense. Uh, to set the record straight, we are far and away the best team in the Big Ten to do that. Uh, and I don't mind, again, giving you the actual numbers. In nine games, we gave up a total of 21 plays that were 20 yards or more. Uh, and I know there's no way for the listener to know is that how good is that? How is that how much above average is that? That's 2.33 plays per game. The conference average is 3.81. And that may not sound like a lot of difference, but that's a play and a half every game times nine games and be 13 and a half plays or roughly 13 or 14 plays. And just to clarify before we go on here, Don, just want to make clear to everybody when we say, when we use the term explosive plays, we're talking about any offensive plays of 20 or more yards. That's correct. 20 yards or more. Um, so we gave up a total of 21. To kind of put it in easier to understand perspective, 21 in nine games, the, the number two teams that were tied were Minnesota and, believe it or not, Northwestern. And they only gave up, I say only, they gave up 29 in nine games, which is still a pretty big spread. From the 29 is a pretty big jump which is why I say we were clearly the best team in the conference. It wasn't close. And to give you an idea of action, the average is 3.81. So we're way above average on defense. On the low end, Indiana was last. They gave up 45 explosive plays in their nine games, which, of course, is more than twice as many as what we did. That would be five plays per game. And the the listeners need to realize an explosive play typically – results in points even if it's only a 20 something yard game in so many cases it puts you in field goal range and of course better yet if it's a 40 or 50 yard play very likely a touchdown at the very least it it flips the field how indicative is the explosive play category or stat How, how, how how much correlation is there between that stat and winning and losing football games or can you tell me that can you tell us that well the interesting thing without giving up too many secrets. Uh, in general, that that alone didn't really produce a great record. Okay. Uh, it was surprising. Well, North, it Northwestern was. really hurt them on that. <laughs> Maybe that's, exactly. That's exactly right. Northwestern was inept in different ways. Yeah. Uh, they didn't give up big plays, but on the other hand, people went up and down the field against them, and they and they turned the ball over, and they couldn't couldn't move it on offense. They just had a myriad of of uh, problems. But, um, but to give you an idea of how it fits together, one thing you want to look at, of course, is what's the marginal explosive plays? In other words, what if you compared your offense with your defense? Which ones work together to produce good results? And that's where we fall off a little bit. We finished third. But to give you an idea, again, that it may matter a lot, the two teams ahead of us, when you look at marginal explosive plays, I believe you're familiar with them. They're called Ohio State and Michigan. We were third, and we were plus 0.67 per game. But to give you an idea, Michigan was plus 1.40 per game. Ohio State plus 2.22 per game. Huge difference. Now, uh, and now we, just, we were actually, just, no, not to interrupt you, Don, but I just want to just – and this is a lot of – we had some discussion before we started recording this, but some of this is totally – most of this is just totally organic as we go, as we go on the show. But, Don – I'm just thinking as you bring up Michigan and Ohio State and how uh, proficient they are at not only limiting explosive plays defensively, but producing explosive plays on offense, given Iowa's uh, defense and and I don't want to say dominance, but it, they are by far and away the best team in the Big Ten at uh, diminishing or not allowing explosive plays. So my question is, as bad as Iowa's offense has been in creating explosive plays, how many explosive plays would the offense need to create to sort of trim down that gap between Iowa and those two powers, Michigan and Ohio State? Well, when you look at the margin, like, uh, let's see, margin again. um, Margin on explosive plays. We were plus we were plus six in nine games. In nine games, Ohio State was plus twenty. To give you a comparison, they were okay. fourteen more in nine games. So they were a play and a half in every game, if you want to think of it that way. A little more than a play and a half. Uh, and again, that may not sound like a lot, but one explosive play could be a touchdown, of course. 
sure. I'm just thinking. No, 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 just, we we talk, Where does Iowa rank in offensive explosive plays? I knew you were going to get to that. <laughs> we rank 13th. To, okay. To, to um, it's kind of like yanking a tooth. I had to tell you in a hurry so it didn't feel so bad. To, to, to Northwestern. Rutgers was last. Rutgers, okay. So yeah, so Northwestern. Northwestern was ahead we of were sandwiched between Northwestern and Rutgers. <laughs> okay, so I just uh, the reason I bring that up, Don, is you know, can you generate an extra explosive play per game this year with the weapons that are Caleb Brown and Seth Anderson and Eric All and Luke Lachey? They do have weapons. Or I, I don't want to say like obviously they lo- want to make very clear. I'm not downplaying the abilities of guys like Arlen Bruce and, and Keegan Johnson, but they did add some explosiveness in the transfer portal. I think that's well documented. So is it right. feasible to think that they could add an explosive play per game based on personnel? Is that a reasonable move upwards to you? Uh, maybe one per game. The average again was 3.81. We finished last year averaging 3.0 per game. So one more play per game would put us a little above average. Yeah. I think that's doable. Yeah. And, and as you've heard me say before, Corey, that's one way to do it is simply to put players on the field that are better, more capable of providing you with big plays. But there's another part of the equation too, and that's simply engineering your offense so that you actually go out and make big plays. Right. Some plays are designed to take big, big play opportunities. And of course you may not hit on them, but it's that old, it's like that old saying, you know, how are you going to make a lot of money if you don't, if you don't bet, you know, you got to bet to make a lot of money. And um, nothing ventured, nothing gained, that type of thing. So we need to engineer more big plays by by being more creative with our play calling. And then it's it, it's uh, safe to say that the players we have to put on the field should provide us with an additional boost to our explosive plays on offense. I'm going to come back to explosive plays because I want to ask you about a conversation that I had with Brian Ferentz at Media Day. And I know you went back and watched that little exchange I had with him. I just want to get your perspective as an offensive coordinator. But I want to talk about red zone efficiency real quick because that is something you brought up to me prior to starting this this record that you feel like Iowa's – if there's anything Iowa can improve on defensively, it's uh, being able to keep the other team out of the end zone while, uh, I'm assuming, um, forcing more field goals. Can you talk a little bit about Iowa's struggles, if you will, if you want to call them struggles with red zone efficiency defensively? Yes. Uh, first off, you got to realize, you know, I've done this now for eight years, so it, it took me, it didn't take me very long at all to figure out the best way to evaluate red zone success. And I think this will make sense to you the way I explain it. Let's just talk about our, our defensive success. Just for the sake of argument, let's imagine we play Northwestern or uh, let's imagine Rutgers. Uh, and let's just for the sake of argument, Rutgers is down there three times in our red zone, let's say, in this fictitious game I'm coming up with. And and once we defeat them on downs and twice we make them kick field goals, that's three opportunities that produced a total of six points, right? So that's 2.0 per opportunity, right? Three opportunities, six points. All we got, all they got was two field goals. That's a good performance. Um, and now let's go forward to another game. Let's just say for the sake of argument, it's Ohio State. Or based on this year's schedule, let's say it's Penn State. In the Penn State game, just for the sake of argument, Penn State's only in the red zone one time. But Penn State gets a touchdown on that one opportunity, and we lose the game 10-7. Here's my point. What is our average in the Penn State game? They were there once. They produced six points. We don't count PATs or two-point plays because I don't want someone to win just because they went for two. So I simply award points. You either get six, you get three, or you get zero. And for that matter, if you're taking a knee at the end of the game, statistically that's an that's an NCAA description of another failure in the red zone. I'm not counting that. You're not trying to score. So I don't count that possession. So I've purified this data as best I can. My point is there's only one opportunity to keep Penn State out of the end zone or keeping them out of red zone even. They were down there once, but on that one attempt, they scored six points. Their average for that game is 6.0. Let's think back to the Rutgers average. It was 2.0. What I don't do, I don't say, well, there were three opportunities 
in the Rutgers game and one here. So that's four opportunities that have produced a total of 12 points, right? So that average would be, if you looked at both those games in combination, it would be four opportunities for a total of 12 points. 3.0 would be the average. That's not how I figure it. I weigh every game the same, which means that that Penn State game counts as 6.0. The other game, the Rutgers game, counts as 2.0. I average those two two averages together, and, of course, that gives you an average of 4.0. So I hope that makes sense to the yeah. listeners. I don't give you extra credit just because you allowed them down there a lot and you actually defended them. Uh, the point is you, you shouldn't allow them to be down there a lot, especially the better teams. You better not allow them to do it because the odds are you will lose the game. Incidentally, red zone occurrences is actually a little better indicator of, of winning success, uh, even more so than red zone efficiency in the red zone. Now, you'll find that interesting. Uh, they're both good stats to have on your side. And I uh, obviously red zone occurrences, same thing. I base it on a, on a per game average. In other words, every game stands alone. You don't get extra credit. I'll give you a better example. Let's talk about offense. We're down there six times against Rutgers. That's nice because against Penn State, we didn't get down there at all. If you average those two games together, you'd say, well, that's that's three per game. Uh, well, no, it's not because in one game, you were down there six times, but in the other game, you were not down there at all. So I'm going to give you 0.0 in one game. And in the other game, of course, even though that was a good stat for one game, it was still only one game. Right. So I'm just curious – what was I? What was Iowa's biggest bugaboo as it relates to keeping teams out of the red zone once they get down to the, the red zone, or excuse me, keep yeah, keeping teams out of the end zone once they get down to the red zone. You know, that's um, I'm glad you brought that up because there have been years where we were the number one team in doing that. Uh, okay, red zone scoring success. Uh, this year, the average success of a team in the red zone was four point one eight per opportunity. And just think back again, six points is a touchdown, three points is a field goal. So if you have half and half, if you have half touchdowns, half field goals, your average would be 4.5 if they had the same number of opportunities, right? So obviously, if you can score a touchdown half the time, that's not too bad, provided the others are all worth three. The problem, of course, is when you fell on downs. The problem is when you miss the kick, have it blocked, that sort of thing. And again, I'm basing it on on a, a per game average. So points per opportunity, Iowa's defense finished fifth. I know that's a surprise. It was probably a surprise to Phil Parker too, but I can't argue. And you think back, I remember specifically Ohio state was in the red zone a lot and had a good average. And there were a few other teams that were not down there so much maybe, and yet had a good average. Iowa state. Iowa state's a good example. Maybe. Well, that's not conference. Doesn't count, but sure. But but, 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 that's, but that's but that's a that's kind of a I don't want to say a, not a dichotomy but that's kind of a, a microcosm of the of yeah. the Big Ten stat then exactly maybe we won the game even uh, maybe Rutgers was a good example we beat them twenty seven to ten maybe they were in the red zone one time maybe the field goal came from outside the red zone maybe their one red zone opportunity was worth six points well it's a per game average so for that game we gave up six and I know you could argue well that. That's a little misleading because we really didn't care. We won the game comfortably anyway. Uh, that's all true, except I still go back to the Ohio State game where they not only got into the red zone, but in general they produced touchdowns. They had a good average against us in the red zone. I believe it was close to 5.0. I can't recall the average. I think it was 4.7, 4.8 in the red zone. They were down there a lot, and they produced touchdowns far too often for our liking. So – the point is, the number one team in the Big Ten in red zone scoring success defensively was Minnesota, actually. To give you an idea of, of where it stood, 3.01 per opportunity versus our 3.6. Now, we're above average on defense. We're fifth. Uh, the conference average is 4.18. So we're half a we're half a point better than the average. Uh, that all sounds good. Uh, but which teams are uh, up there again? Uh, Minnesota, Penn State had a good red zone defense. Illinois had a good red zone defense. And there's Michigan again ahead of us. Uh, Ohio State did not. Uh, but they didn't seem to be too worried about it because they have a habit of just trying to outscore people anyway. And they're typically able to do it. Um, so 
Uh, Phil will be disappointed. I do recall a year ago, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, we were 2.98 a year ago. That's the lowest number I've ever heard of. So you can see why Coach Parker is not going to be very happy with 3.69. It's good, but not not where they normally have been. So all these analytics, and and again, you recently sat down with Kirk, and you sit down with Kirk throughout the year to provide these analytics. And and you, I mean, obviously, I'm I'm assuming this preseason meeting that you have with him is sort of the big haul, right? (laughs) Yeah, he had the report before I left town on vacation. I didn't talk to him about the report until a couple of weeks later. And he had spent some time looking at it over that two weeks. So I'm just curious, Don, as it relates to uh, Phil Parker and the defense, we're, we're sort of nitpicking at some of these. St- I mean, I don't want to say you're nitpicking. We are. we are nitpicking because this unit up and down has been terrific. From a personnel standpoint, we haven't talked personnel yet. We do have a depth chart that's been released. Um, are you concerned with some of the losses? Obviously, Jack Campbell, Seth Benson, Riley Moss, Lucas Van Ness to start um do you feel like personnel wise this defensive unit can kind of pick right up where last year's unit left off or do you feel like uh, it's going to be a bit of a bit of a learning curve for some of these less experienced guys like xavier wampa like even a cooper de who's you know we, we act like he's a vet he's you know this will be his second year where he starts the year as as the guy right i think it's a realistic goal that we can perform at our consistently high level And I say that, Corey, uh, because uh, the pieces are a little bit interchangeable. Uh, And the point I'm going to make with our listeners and with you is there's still all the players are subjected to the same teaching and the same concepts that have proven to be very successful. And you have an idea, of course, of how we play. We do a great job of keeping the ball in front of us. We do a great job of eliminating big plays. If you're going to score points against us, you're going to, in general, be forced to play on a long field. You're going to be forced to be able to drive 60 or 80 yards. And to do that, of course, you're going to have to snap the ball more than a few times. You're going to have to snap the ball uh, so many that uh, history says you're not going to be able to get it done. You're going to shoot yourself in the foot with a penalty or a turnover or the clock's going to run out on you at the end of either half. Um, and, um, And even if you're able to drive into scoring range, Typically, you're going to have to be forced to kick field goals and not score touchdowns. Our red zone defensive concepts are outstanding. Uh, it's stood the test of time. They'll, they might tweak it a little bit from year to year, but primarily we do a great job of keeping the ball in front of us, reacting up with hard hits and sure tackling. And not to mention, of course, if they are trying to throw the ball, there's a thing called a pass rush that's significant on our part too. And all those things work together to make us an effective defense. So I think the players understand. They buy in. uh, Phil's able to show them. Look at what we've been able to accomplish in recent years. Part of it is personnel. Part of it is concept. We've got wonderful concepts that have have been refined uh, and and have stood the test of time. And and we're smart enough not to to mess with them just for the sake of trying something different. Uh, If we're going to make a change, you can bet it's been given a lot of thought. Uh, and that's what gives us such great success on defense. We are going to look at personnel, including the defense. We're going to take a look at the depth chart that was released on Monday. But I don't want to get off the subject of analytics. And you talked about on on defense how to create or how to uh, eliminate more explosive plays. I, I want to talk a little bit about creating more explosive plays. And part of it not only is personnel, as you brought up, but part of it is play calling and scheme and approach. And just one example of, I, I think, um, a shortcoming that this offense has had as it relates to play calling is its use or lack thereof of waste downs. And I talked to right. Brian Ference about this subject at Media Day. Um, and you listen to that exchange. I won't play it for everybody on this show, but if people want to Go back and listen to that exchange one more time. You can do that. I'll throw it up here at the top of the screen for people to click on when they're watching the show. But uh, just your thoughts on Brian Ference's response to that conversation. I know one thing that he said that was a little bit odd to me was he made the statement that he can't envisioning he can't envision a scenario uh, ever in which third and one would be a waste down. It seemed like an odd statement. Maybe you can tell me I'm wrong uh, because you're a play caller and I'm not. But it just seemed like Brian went kind of a roundabout way of explaining 
the defensive philosophy as opposed to explaining how we need to take care of, we need to take more advantage of these short yardage situations where we have a down to use. And it's almost like the concept of waste a waste down um, is backwards to Brian because Brian made the comment that every down's important. You know, we don't view any right. as a, 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 a wasted down. We don't want to waste any downs. Well, that's not what that means. <laughs> that the concept of waste down is you've earned, you've you've gotten seven, eight, nine yards, and now you've earned it because you have confidence in your offense on the following play. Even if you take a shot and you know you you get nothing, you have confidence on the following play that you're going to be able to run it up the gut or do whatever you need to do to get a first down, whether that be on a short yarded situation on second down, short yarded situation on third down. Just your thoughts on Brian's response to that question. Well, here's the truth, Corey. Uh, third down and one, uh, the, the comment that I can't ever envision third and one being a waste down, that's illogical, honestly, and I'll explain why. Uh, there are any number of situations in a game, and I, let me just state an obvious one. Um, you're playing from behind, and um, – and it's third and one. You're out at midfield. Uh, a really seasoned head coach uh, on third and one at midfield. I've already mentioned that you're behind. You're playing from behind. A really smart head coach, even though he's not calling plays, as soon as the ball's blown dead and it's obvious that it's third and one, one that's really into the game will simply state to the play caller, you've got fourth down. Now, what he means by that is we're going to go for it. I've already decided we're going to go for it. So what I'm telling you, if you choose to make third and one a waste down, have at it. He didn't say, uh, we're going to go for it on fourth down, but I still want you to run the ball on third and one. He didn't say that. The head coach said, you've got fourth down, which is his way of saying, if you want to take a shot, feel free to do so. After all, we are playing from behind, right? So that's really what the head coach is saying We've got two downs to make a first down. I've already decided we're going to go on fourth down. So if you want to take a shot, then make your call. Let's go. Um, that only makes sense if you're playing from behind. Incidentally, the game's going to be a little bit shorter this year if you're playing from behind because, as you know, we're not going to stop the clock on made first downs. Right. Except in the last two minutes of either half. I don't like that rule. It's going to shorten the game. Uh, I think it – I don't – I understand they're worried about – um, players having to having to risk injury and all that. But the bottom line, they claim it's only going to shorten the game by seven or eight plays. I would be willing to bet you it's going to shorten it by more than that. Um, and um, I just don't like the idea. When I'm thinking of all-time stats, I'm thinking about what about a quarterback, what about a running back that ran for 290 yards, except this year's game is shorter than last year's game. And the school record was 292 yards, and he missed it by two yards. Well, a year ago, he would have had more chances to continue running the ball. The game's shorter. It's unfortunate that he doesn't have a chance to break the record because he really deserves to have the record. You make you follow me there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah he's, he's playing in a shorter game. Um, so that's just my opinion on that. But getting back to that waste down situation, it's third and one. The head coach has already told me as a play caller, we're going to go on fourth down. You've got fourth down. That's the shortest way to say it. That's how Hayden might say it. You've got four down. Uh, and um, and at that point, of course, he's given you the he's given you the green light to take a shot. Uh, that's what that's what happens in the NFL. That's what happens in a lot of college programs. I know that. Uh, so uh, third and one certainly has the potential to be a waste down at any point in the game. And what gives it that potential? The knowledge that you're going to go for it on fourth down. That doesn't mean you have to take a shot. At that point, you really didn't use third and one as a waste down. But if you did take a shot, you clearly did. So I hope just that curious. makes sense. Yeah, it does. And, and I'm just curious, Don, what was your reaction to the rest of that conversation with Brian on, on the waste down situation? Did his explanation of, of how they approach things differently than maybe your average offensive coordinator does? I mean, he brought up Bill Belichick and Rex Ryan and these different people that uh, you know obviously have acknowledged waste downs in football but the response kind of seemed like to me like you know that we just don't really call plays that way did that is that how it resonated with you well that's a little bit consistent with our issues on offense is we simply don't i'll say it this way Corey. one way to make more big plays 
it sounds stupid again, but it's so true. One way to make more big plays is to try to make more big plays. Right, and I would think an I would think an offense that struggles to engineer big plays would be even more. It would be even more important for that offense to take advantage of those few first uh, those few waste downs that you may back yourself into. Very <laughs> if true. you find a way to get listen, if you find a way to get eight nine yards on first down, Don, you better be hurling that thing downfield. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and having said that, Corey, as you know, we, we always self-scouted ourselves. So we actually knew, let's imagine we got a big game coming up in three weeks, and we know what our tendency is on third and short. Yeah. And we're playing a couple of weaker teams the next two weeks. We're going to do what we can to pad that percentage to make that third and one percentage go even higher in terms of running the football because we're looking down the road, and we've already made up our mind. Against Michigan in third and short, we're going to take some shots. And the thing that's going to give us a better chance is Michigan has studied us and they know that we traditionally have not been taking shots. We haven't been on purpose because we're saving them for Michigan. Hope that makes sense. That's just, that's just forward thinking that a football coach might do. We're setting them up. If, in other words, I think uh, we can sum all this up Don by saying that all of us are going to be following Iowa's use of, first, of uh, waste downs throughout the 2023 season. Just like people are going to be following the points per game as it goes each each game if it reaches that 25 point mark or stays at that 25 point mark, we're all going to be right. following because Iowa doesn't get many waste downs. I mean, traditionally not at least in the last 2 to 3 years with with an inefficient offense, obviously you, more often than not you're not getting 7 8 9 yards on first down and it is more it's obvious. I acknowledge what you said and and I will acknowledge that in, in with the uh, discussion with Brian that it is rare. I, I shouldn't even say rare, but it's it's uncommon to have third and one be a waste down, but it's not unheard of. So anyway, I just figured I'd touch on that with you. I'm sure that that topic will come up during the season, during our post game shows. Straight from the man cave, Kinnick under the kitchen, authentic, original player art prints are being drawn up for Hawkeye fans everywhere. From Under the Kitchen's Murray Legacy print, which features former Hawkeye Kenyon Murray, current Hawkeye Chris Murray, and current Sacramento King Keegan Murray, to football players Lucas Van Ness, Tori Taylor, and Cooper DeGene, to wrestlers Tony Cassiope, Alex Marinelli, and Real Woods. Oh, and only one of the greatest athletes to ever compete at Iowa, Spencer Lee. There are so many options available, and they make great gifts. Visit Under the Kitchen on Facebook or at Under the Kitchen's new website. It's underthekitchen.square.site. That's underthekitchen.square.site. Check out Under the Kitchen today and get your authentic, original Hawkeye print. I want to look at the depth chart that was released on Monday, Don, okay. because uh, this kind of goes back to our we, how we touched on personnel a little bit. Uh, here is a uh, copy of the depth chart, I think, if we can get the copy up here. Maybe, maybe not. Let's see if we can. There it is. Okay, so uh, this was released on Monday. W what struck me, Don, as I'm looking through this depth chart that was released, and things can happen. You've got, what, four days of practice ahead uh, that injuries can occur, movement can happen. What struck me, though, Don, is how healthy this team appears to be prior to the start of the season. I'm just thinking back to last season. Just look at wide receiver, for instance. Last year, heading into week one, we knew uh, Nico was out. We knew Deontay Vines was out. Like right now, everybody except maybe Jacob Bostic, who probably wouldn't be on the depth chart anyways. I know he was on the pre-camp depth chart. Everybody at wide receiver is healthy. Raga Aini's listed. Seth Anderson from Charleston Southern's there. You've got Deontay Vines, Caleb Brown, the Ohio State transfer, all listed. You've got your three top backs listed. Caleb Johnson, uh, Leshawn Williams, Jazzy and Patterson. Your fullback, Hayden Large, is listed with his backup, Rusty Va Van Wetzinger. Obviously, the big one, Cade McNamara, listed. Uh, apparently, Joe Labus is back because he is listed as your third string behind Deacon Hill. There is no or there. It's Deacon Hill as QB2. Joe Labus is QB3. And then, of course, the... the uh, I don't want to, want to call it a circus, but the the uh, competition, I should say, up front along that offensive line has been a talking point for the last two years, really. And some of the youth, some of the 
uh, problems they've had, not only in the interior of that line, but, but on the outsides as well. Mason Richmond's locked in at left tackle with Jack uh, Dotzler uh, backing him up. Nick DeYoung, Rusty Feff, the transfer from Miami, Ohio. You've got Connor Colby and Bo Stevens anchoring down the right, right guard spot. Logan Jones is your center with Tyler Ellsbury backing him up. Jennings Dunker currently listed as your starting right tackle, but the good news is it sounds like Dejon Parker is back. He's missed a lot of time throughout spring, had a bunch of swelling issues after his knee procedure uh, during the summer and fall. He is back now. That's huge news for that line. I think he may be the only natural right tackle. Don, what are your reactions just from looking at this offensive depth chart preseason, or I should say pre-week one? Well, one thing that jumps out at me, is that a typo for Deacon Hill, 258 pounds? I, I don't think that's a typo, Don. I don't – no, I thought I, he lost some weight. Uh, I think he ha- well. Let's see. Let's see what the actual rot. Let's go ahead and talk about that for a second. You want to talk about Deacon Hill, Don? Uh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> not if he's two fifty eight. I know. Uh, according to the Iowa roster, he is two fifty eight. Okay, he's, he's still needs six, to drop some weight. He's six three two fifty eight. What was he when he got here? Was he two sixty? I, I didn't know if he was ever that heavy. I thought he was maybe 250 or something, but uh, is that a whatever. problem? What, what, why is that a problem? Well, you've always heard me talk about ideal quarterbacks can extend plays. To extend plays requires you to be able to run around a little bit, as Cade McNamara can do. Uh, Deacon at 258 is going to struggle with that aspect of his game. I think anyone would. That's too much weight to be carrying. I do believe. Okay. So besides the. Besides that, is there anything else you want to bring up about the dev chart? Are you, well, are, you are you surprised? Am I right? And when I am I on track when I bring up the fact that all these guys are listed and it appears? I mean, now some of these guys may not play. That's possible. Um, perhaps a guy or two uh, don't. Maybe maybe there's somebody on here that was involved in the betting thing, and and we're not going to hear about that until an hour or two before kickoff with the new rule that Big Ten schools have to announce availability prior to kickoff. But, I mean, doesn't it seem like they're more healthy than normal based on this depth chart? Well, I think maybe that's a true reflection of our, of our health for two reasons. I think about it last year. We were disappointed with the way the season finished. As you know, if we could have found a way to win game 12, we would have been in Indianapolis. And so that forces a young man, and for that matter, the coaches and strength, strength staff too, Go back and examine what went wrong, and one of the things that might um, might impact an individual or any number of individuals on the team is what could we do differently than we did a year ago? We didn't get it done a year ago, even though we were close. Couldn't be closer than to get into game 12, needing a win to represent the West. Uh, maybe for that reason alone, you have guys that have been more dedicated this summer than they've ever been before which gives them a chance to be healthy throughout camp, more so than those guys that were not quite so committed in the past maybe. I'm just indicating that is a, a possible reason for why they might be healthier than they were in, in a year or two uh, recent cases. And then beyond that, maybe you give the coaches some credit for recognizing we're starting off with Utah State, uh, you know, we're not going to take them lightly, but we're not going to. We're going to be sure not to beat ourselves up too much in camp. We don't have to start off against a Big Ten opponent. Um, you know, we try to be healthy. We're, you know, camp's all about teaching, and it's all about knowing, knowing how much work we should be doing. And there were times, sure, when Coach Fry is a wise coach, or Coach Ferentz is a wise coach, might say we got to back off a little bit. We're going to kill them off in practice, unless we unless we back off. And it's more important, I'd rather have them healthy than to kill them off in practice. And I shouldn't use that term, of course, but you know what I mean by that. Uh, are we guilty of doing too much work? Let's be sure we – I'd rather have them chomping at the bit come game time and have a little less contact in camp than have them beaten up during camp. Hope that makes sense. And maybe that's one reason we really are healthier. We're just speculating here. As you know, Corey, we don't have any way of knowing if that – Step chart is 100% accurate in terms of injuries. Um, for all we know, several of these guys have missed quite a bit of time during camp, and yet they're projected to be ready to, to play on Saturday. So maybe we've gotten healthier over the last week or two. I don't doubt that that's 
the case because maybe we had some injuries in the early part of the camp uh, that we've now gotten over. I'm just desperately trying to find some indication that Deacon Hill's not actually 258 still. Uh, <laughs> I, I just uh, so pr- in the spring he was listed according to Iowa at 230. I wonder if he'd even been weighed in at that point because that's the only number I could find from his uh, recruiting bio was 225 230. Uh, I don't think he gained 30 pounds throughout the summer. Uh, that's that's that is concerning. I, I I'm glad you caught that because I would not have. And just to I mean I want to make everybody clear we're not weight shaming anybody here. But no. when you look at look at his cohorts, you got Cade McNamara at, at 6'1", 205. Joe Labus is 6'4", 213. Deacon Hill is 6'3", 258. That is a concern if that's accurate. Um, and that's yeah. what the Iowa roster says. So how, how do you feel about I mean, obviously, Cade went down during Kids Day. He's back now. Is the quad a lingering? Th- I mean, do you? Is that something that makes you kind of wince just thinking about the fact that he tweaked that quad mid-fall camp, or is that something you think can be healed and we won't even hear about that the rest of the year? You know, there's really no way to know, Corey. My experience has been um, anybody that tells you they know for sure how that's going to play out, I don't care if they are an athletic trainer. They still don't know for sure. You know, they're going to give you their best guess, of course, as to what might happen going forward, but I don't think anyone would know with any – a uh, high degree of accuracy, what might happen up ahead. How confident right now are you with uh, with the wide receiver room? I mean, they've got they've got the transfer portal guys. It seems like they're healthy. Seth Anderson looked good during Kids Day. I know you watched that. You weren't there in person, but you watched some of that film back. Um, just your thoughts on the, on the wide receiving core. Yeah, I'm glad to see that Seth uh, and Caleb have made their way under the two deep. Um, you've heard me talk about, I know, for a fact, because one of my former players, Coach Caleb Brown, when he was a younger a younger uh, student athlete in high school, um, it was just flag football, but still, you learn a lot about a kid, especially in the summertime, if it's some kind of flag football competition. If he's really into football, uh, then it's going to show up because you, it's not easy to be enthusiastic about playing a flag football game in the middle of the summer, but um, those guys that are really into it will do that, and I've been assured by my former player that I know I can trust. And Caleb Brown's a wonderful young man. He's going to give you nothing but his best. And that's precisely why we uh, asked him to be part of our football team is our coaching staff got that same impression with their investigation as what, what I heard from my former player. So he's got talent. It's not it's not a, a big mark against you. If you cannot crack the two deep at Ohio State, I would suggest to you year in and year out, that's one of the best – receiving rooms in the country uh, they have outstanding players uh, all the time at receiver uh, maybe Caleb's not quite good enough to play meaningful snaps for them but I certainly think he's got a great chance to do it for us because we're not quite as talented as a group as they are and that's true for every other team in the Big Ten also Ohio State's out in front of everyone uh, Seth Anderson I was impressed with Seth for what I saw uh, Coach Fra always believed in bloodlines, and uh, the fact that Seth's dad was a great player, I think it's no surprise that Seth might play a little as his dad does. And um, he's probably going to have a lot of chances to demonstrate that before he leaves Iowa. So I'm excited about the fact that Seth is showing up well in camp. Uh, even though he played FCS football, uh, you know and I know that there are a lot of outstanding players in the FCS they can certainly play at a high level and compete very well at the FBS level. And I suspect he's one of them. And Seth Anderson is on my list of, of guys that they just make it easy to root for him. Just a nice kid. Um, and, you know, I'd say the same thing about Dejon Parker. A lot of these guys, I mean, just nice kids. But Dejon Parker, you, you're rooting for him. Both of those transfers came from, even though Seth's dad had all the success he did, I mean, Seth had to earn his way here. Um, you know, going the Charleston Southern. And by the way, Charleston Southern is not some. You're a you're a, one of the all time greats at the FCS level, Don. Charleston Southern is not some power. So to stand out at Charleston Southern, he had to be really good, and he was. He was an all conference guy. So uh, let's look at the defense and special teams here. Obviously, the depth of, up that defensive line um, was hurt with the announcement that Noah Shannon would be suspended for the season. 
Iowa, of course, is appealing that. I don't have a whole lot of confidence in the NCAA to change their mind on that decision. I think it's extremely unfortunate for Noah. Uh, the good news for the for Jay Neiman, Kelvin Bell, and the staff is they have a lot of depth up there with Deontay Craig, Max Llewellyn, Y.A. Black, Aaron Graves, Logan Lee, Jeremiah Pittman, Joe Evans, Ethan Herkett. I mean, every one of those guys has played meaningful snaps, Don. And there's probably a guy or two behind that top eight, like Ontario Thompson uh, or Brian Allen, who was really good during kids day. Just your thoughts, even without Noah Shannon, is this one of the deeper defensive lines that you've seen under Phil Parker? One word answer. Yes. Uh, and I think you're going to see its effect, Corey, starting this Saturday. Think about this right now, as a, I saw the weather tonight forecast high for Saturday, 93 degrees. Uh, it's, <laughs> Thank and you. that's that's the actual actual air temp, of course, down on the turf uh, at, at two o'clock in the afternoon toward the end of the game. Yeah. It's going to be over a hundred for sure. It'll be over a hundred most of the game on the turf. Uh, and the reason it's going to it's going to be a um, a factor on Saturday is because a lot of those eight defensive linemen are going to have pretty equal number of snaps. On the other hand, is it hard to imagine that? The backups playing for Utah State might not be uh, that competitive with the starter. And as a result of that, you're going to have some offensive linemen that are going to – the goal is for them to be able to play all day long, and that's going to be next to impossible for those guys to do on a hot day. I'm guessing Utah summers are not quite as severe as what we're going to have on Saturday. Our guys will weather the the, uh, the difficult conditions better than, than those offensive linemen, I'm sure of that. So if – if the game is in doubt um, toward the end and they have to throw the ball every down, we're going to be teeing off with a lot of fresh linemen against a lot of tired offensive linemen. And that means the quarterback is going to – he is a dual-threat quarterback, incidentally. He's going to be running around for his life. He's going to be trying to extend plays. I'll make a bold prediction right now. We're going to win on Saturday uh, on edge on defensive sacks. We're going to sack them more than they sacked us. So is that more confidence in the defensive line or the or the offensive line? <laughs> I got a lot of confidence in our in our defensive line and not so much on offense, but I do think we have better depth in our offensive line than what we've had in the last couple of years. That may help us a little bit. You always heard me say, Corey, I always told my coaches as we were getting ready to play game one on a typically hot day, I always reminded them two weeks ago you were agonizing over who's going to start and who's the backup and and don't forget that because you need to play that backup it's going to be very difficult conditions on saturday let's let's be sure the backup gets plenty of snaps so that starter deserves some relief and we're not even 100 percent sure that he's the best player so let's find out on saturday who the better player is let's give those backups significant snaps you're the same guy that wasn't sure who the starter was just two weeks ago so let them both play let's figure out on game day, who the better player is by playing them both. You got cornerback Cooper DeGene is back after being dinged up during fall camp. Uh, your boy, TJ Hall, <laughs> uh, he's he's back for another year. Of course, you coached Terrence, his dad, and uh, I know TJ is another kid. You just easy to root for, good kid, and uh, had his had his uh, took his lumps at uh, against Nebraska last year was thrown into the fire, but that'll just make him better. So they have decent depth, I think, at cornerback. And then Deshaun Lee on the other side, backing up Jamari Harris, who was impressive during Kids Day. Both those guys were impressive during Kids Day. And at safety, Xavier Wampa, first year as the starter. Quinn Schulte, um, Cohen Intringer, younger guy, redshirt freshman. I know he really impressed Iowa um, last fall, and I'm talking like fall of his freshman year. Um, and then Sebastian Castro will be your cash guy. Jay Higgins, really impressive. I mean, he is so impressive with how he carries himself, and he seems to really embrace not the – I don't want to call it the Jack Campbell role because I know he, he's not Jack Campbell and, and he's not trying to be Jack Campbell, but just that leadership void that was left by not only Jack Campbell but by Seth Benson leaving for the league. Um, I think Nick Jackson and Jay Higgins, if they stay healthy, have a chance to almost fill that, that void, Don, and that says a lot. Now, we'll see if it transpires. Kyler Fisher is an experienced former walk-on, and then Jaden Harrell here is listed who hasn't played much of it all um, but might be the future at middle. 
Um, your thoughts on the secondary and on the linebacking group? Well, I'm very impressed with everything I've heard about Nick Jackson. I think he's, you got to realize, he's been very productive for the last two years at Virginia. Um, you know, he's not hes not some young whippersnapper. He's a guy that's already got his degree. Uh, he's very serious about playing at a high level, and he's going to fit in very well, a lot like Seth played, that's for sure. Very similar production, I would bet, out of Nick. Um, I'm anxious to see Sebastian Castro. I think he's going to have an outstanding year. And as you know, we will at times play a third linebacker. If it's a heavy offensive formation, you're going to see Kyler Fisher out there uh, as the Leo. But uh, if it's some kind of spread personnel, you're going to see Castro as the cash. I think he's an outstanding player. He certainly knows what he's doing. And he's going to give us a lot of good play at that cash position. And, of course, he also is capable of playing the strong safety position in behind Xavier, too. So I see a lot of a lot of uh, opportunity with both the starter and the backup to play well. And that's what excites me is if we can be good enough to be able to plug in some backups and you hardly notice they're in the game, that's a really good sign because that means even if the starter does go down, maybe we give the starter a slight edge over the backup. But truthfully, if the starter goes down, we're still going to be okay. And that's the beauty of playing good backups is because they gain – they gain experience uh, even as a backup. And uh, if we do lose our starter, and let's face it, um, you know, it's a war of attrition in a football season. You better you better be giving those backups snaps when you have a chance to because you might end up having to play with them in the very near future. So we hope not. We hope the starters can all stay healthy, but that's simply not realistic that that's going to happen. One thing I did think was interesting is when the uh, Big Ten Network crew stopped in Iowa City, Jerry DiNardo, who's a, a former head coach, made a point of saying that when they were there, and it was just one day, but there weren't many guys on the ground. And he said that's sort of an indication to me that this is maybe a more athletic Iowa team than perhaps teams in the past. Is that a fair way to judge a team's athleticism slash fitness, um, less injuries in fall camp? Because if so... Uh, they have, st again, they, it appears that they've stayed relatively healthy this year, especially compared to the last couple of years. Yeah, we always talk about great position on the ball on defense. And if you're always in the right position, typically you don't have to leave your feet to try to make a play. Uh, you know, you are, if you're supposed to have inside leverage on the ball, then you maintain inside leverage. On the other hand, if you're supposed to have outside leverage, you keep that. And obviously, as you close on the ball here, we got him sandwiched between two tacklers. And that means neither one of you have to leave your feet. You're able to stay on your feet and run your feet, make contact on that ball carrier. And with a little bit of luck, you'll get the ball out in terms of in terms of fumbles. I did talk to Kirk because I was – I have to admit I was surprised myself as I looked at our, our turnovers from this past year. And we were above average in terms of generating turnovers on, on defense. One of the things I felt in recent years – you've heard me talk about, Corey – we're outstanding in terms of interceptions, but we've been just okay, I think, in terms of fumbles recovered or fumbles caused and then recovered. But then the truth, I looked at it this year, and, and I, I told Kirk this, I said, I, I thought that maybe we just weren't very good at generating fumbles, and I flashed back on a guy I talked to him about, and he, he agreed with me. I said, the guy that comes to mind for me that was so great at generating fumbles – was a guy named Epinesa that plays for the Buffalo Bills now. And if he was in the backfield, he wasn't content to get a sack. He's going to get the ball out. And you remember that very well from his playing days. That's one reason that the Bills are able to are willing to pay him a lot of money to play for them is because he's good at it. And we don't have anybody that's as adept at doing that as, as A.J. was. But the bottom line, I, I had to admit, and I told Kirk, I said, maybe I'm wrong because as I looked at the entire conference – we were number two in the conference in terms of recovering fumbles. Uh, you know, we were above average. I think we had seven recovered, as I recalled, and maybe the average was five, something like that. So we were better than average in terms of forcing fumbles, or at least recovering fumbles. And, of course, that's a function of how many you force, too. So the bottom line, we're pretty good at generating turnovers, and our offense has always been – able to say with pride we're good at protecting the ball on offense last year and of course you know that turnover margins always a good 
stat to have on your side. We were fourth in the league. We uh, gained 17 on defense. We turned the ball over 12 times on offense. We were plus five on nine games. That put us fourth in the league. Incidentally, we're behind Illinois, number one, and then number two and number three, Ohio State and Michigan. That's what good teams do. They do all the fundamentals well. Uh, they don't beat themselves. Ohio State and Michigan were just slightly better than us. Uh, they were uh, plus six. We were plus five. They were plus six in the, in the case of Michigan, of course, in 10 games, which just gave them a very slight edge over us, margin per game I'm talking about. Uh, the number one team in the Big Ten, though, that didn't really take full advantage of it was Illinois. Illinois was actually plus 11 uh, in nine ball games. That's 1.22 per game, and that's far and away the best in the conference. And then, of course, what can you say about uh, the special teams unit besides the fact that uh, maybe the best kicking combo in the conference and one of the best in the country with Drew Stevens back, Torrey Taylor back? They did lose some depth with Aaron Blom. Uh, he is not listed on the uh, roster anymore. I, I reported about a month ago that uh, I had been told that he was stepping away from the team. That right. seems to have transpired. Jack Johnson, by the way, also not on the most recent roster. But uh, with Drew Stevens and Torrey Taylor, and then you got Luke Elkin, really good snapper, um, and Torrey Taylor back as, as the holder. Um, I think the big question mark may be the return game, but at the same time, I think we've seen enough from Cooper the Gene to know he's adequate returning punts we'll see if he can take that next step to be like a charlie jones was at iowa or a desmond king and then can caleb johnson continue where he left off last year on kickoff returns which by the way you and i both know this don kick returns have become kind of a lost art because of just how the game is how the game has changed and there are so few kicks actually return now anyways which i understand the whole injury thing i get that but uh, special teams unit looks strong and the, the sad part of the fair catch on the kickoffs, some of the most exciting plays in football, of course, are 100 yard kick returns. Yeah. And you simply don't get many chances to see them anymore. The good Iowa fan remembers Tim DeWitt returning an opening kickoff in the Super Bowl. Uh, and it didn't do the Falcons enough good, but still something that Tim can always be very pr proud of for what he was able to contribute to that particular game. Any concerns at all? For special teams, Don, are you, I know you're a big Drew Stevens and Torrey Taylor fan. I am. This morning I was asked um, on a radio show, are you concerned about Drew's performance on Kids Day? And I said, no, I'm not. He was 16 for 18 last fall on field goals. He was perfect on PATs. That was done in front of 70,000 people or more on the road sometimes. Uh, so if he had an off day, in front of 5,000, I'm okay with that. Uh, and um, that's just how I feel. Uh, I did qualify it. I said the only reason I would be concerned if I were the coaches is if for some odd reason he hadn't performed that well in camp. I suspect he's performed very well in camp. And I just simply presented it this way, Corey. I don't think – I don't. Th you've heard me say about quarterbacks, they're a little bit like major league pitchers. Some nights those, those pitchers are able to hit the, the right spots – in that strike zone, and other games are a little bit off. Sometimes quarterbacks are a little bit off. Sometimes golfers are a little bit off. Um, you know, not even um, – what's our guy's – Scotty Scheffler. Scotty Scheffler couldn't make a putt last weekend. He's a great golfer, but even though he started off minus 10, it didn't do him any good. And, um, for a chance to win $18 million, it's too bad you start off ahead of the other 29 golfers, and yet you let them pass you up. He simply didn't have his usual good tournament. He's not a great putter anyway. I'll admit that. I wouldn't want him to be kicking field goals for me based on his punting ability. Uh, but you get my drift. Uh, I think I have great confidence in that young man because I know the same thing you know, Corey. Last year before he ever kicked in a game, he was the best kicker in June and July. He was, again, the best kicker in August. Is it any surprise that he kicked well in the fall based on the fact that he was put under the gun and tested and measured every day all summer long. So Drew Stevens, I think, is going to end up kicking in the NFL. That's a lofty claim because some people would argue he doesn't have the kind of range that NFL teams look for. Uh, but I I don't, know like about, I don't know about that, Don. <laughs> they like accuracy, and he's got pretty darn good range, too. Yeah, You're right. He's, he's, been, he's been really good this fall. Just for anybody who's 
who was maybe worried because of uh, maybe a slightly off day during fall during uh, kids day here a couple of weeks ago. He's been really good during fall camp. I mean, he's making 50 plus yarders on a, on the regular. By the way, Iowa did bring in uh, Marshall Meter from Central Michigan to pad that room. I, that's a good ad. I mean, to find a kid like Marshall who had an, didn't have a great year last year, was five of 11. But you look at his first two years, he was one of the best kickers in the MAC his freshman year. Is it conceivable, Corey, they maybe brought him in to maybe become the kickoff man? I don't know that, but I that doubt, would obviously. I doubt that. I, I doubt that because I think I think Drew. I, I maybe I'm not saying you're underestimating Drew's range. I think Drew's going to be handling both. I could be wrong on that. They just don't have anybody, by, right? I mean, it sounded like maybe Alec Wick was working some at kicker, but you got to have a second kicker, right, Don? Well, I saw Alec Wick kick in high school, and to be honest with you, I think he's got limited range compared to to Drew. But honestly, he he was impressive as a high school kicker. Well, Don, if you can get Marshall Meter to come here as a walk-on, sure. Why not? Why? Why not? <laughs> right. Why? So, um, before we get uh, last thing we're going to look at is the Utah State game specifically, and I'll be okay. releasing my preview for that game tomorrow, I believe. Um, but I know you've already looked at the Aggies. Before we get to that, though, I want to look at the schedule specifically as a whole. We've talked about this schedule and how it does shape up nicely for an Iowa team that is returning a lot of experience on defense uh, and did some good things in the transfer portal on offense. But, you know, you look at those first three weeks, Don, this is a, a non-conference schedule that I'm sure will be criticized by the national pundits. Some of that is not Iowa's fault. Uh, Iowa State uh, was 4-8 and eight last year. I know Utah State was down. That's historically been a pretty good program. Uh, of course, the... Uh, old home of Packers quarterback Jordan Love. Uh, Western Michigan lost quite a bit to the transfer portal last year as well. So those are three three games Iowa should win, Don. And then you look at right. Penn State on the road, most difficult game on the schedule. Michigan State lost a lot. They lost their quarterback kind of in a weird situation to an SEC school during the offseason. They're kind of an odd duck right now with that big contract for Mel Tucker. Purdue's got a new coaching staff. Hudson Cards look good, apparently, in fall camp. But again, new system, new coaching staff. Wisconsin's overhauled their system, their staff. They brought in a lot via the portal. Minnesota comes to Kinnick. Northwestern's at Wrigley. They are a disaster right now, Don. We haven't talked about Pat Fitzgerald, but that's a total disaster right now in Evanston. And then Rutgers, I mean, they're coming to Kinnick. Illinois is coming to Kinnick. That, I have no doubt that could be a dogfight, but it is a home game on senior day for Iowa and then trips to uh, Memorial stadium are never easy, but that's a totally different looking team and, and coaching staff. Don, I said to Tom Caker here a couple of weeks ago, I think the floor for this team based on the schedule, and you're going to not going to like me saying this, but the floor for this team based on the schedule is eight wins. I just, if Cade McNamara is healthy, um, obviously you could lose more than that, right? I understand that, but a logical, practical, reasonable floor is eight wins. And I think this team could win 11 games um, if you stay healthy. And, I mean, they'll be favored in at least 10 of those games. Unless something crazy happens, they will be favored in 10 of the 12 games. The only games they won't be favored in, I think, will be Wisconsin and Penn State. Yeah, you might very well be right. I did make this statement, and I know it's true. We're all going to point to the Penn State game. But the truth is, if you can only win one of two games, Penn State or Wisconsin, I wouldn't hesitate for a second to choose Wisconsin. And I don't know if the listeners are aware of why. If you beat if you beat Penn State and you lose to Wisconsin, then you can't just end up tying Wisconsin because if you tie them, they represent. So effectively, the win counts as more than one. Or I guess you could argue it counts as 1.5 because they're going to get the nod if it's head-to-head. -head. If it's based on head-to-head -head competition, then the team that won, of course, is going to prevail. So we certainly want to beat Penn State. We've had pretty good success playing in Happy Valley. Uh, but the more important game is in Cap Randall. And if I had to pick one, I'd favor a win over the Badgers. I will say this, too. The only hesitancy anybody should have about – uh, tabbing Iowa as the favorite in this division 
is the fact that Wisconsin's schedule is almost as easy or as favorable. They get um, Ohio State at home. And I believe they have Indiana and, without looking, maybe Rutgers. That's a pretty favorable schedule, too, Don. Yeah. And they get Iowa at home, of course. So, you know, I, and there's some hesitancy there. And Illinois is maybe my dark horse right now. I know people kind of have dismissed them. They lost uh, Witherspoon on uh, uh, defense to the NFL draft. They lost uh, Tommy DeVito. They lost some pieces. And But the fact of the matter is, Brett Bielema, you, you have a lot of faith in him as a head coach. And, and they've added some good pieces, including their quarterback, Luke Altmeyer from Ole Miss. So they're kind of a dangerous team with a favorable schedule. Do you have any other thoughts on the schedule, just the, the journey ahead? I know from a coaching standpoint, you take one game at a time, but opportunity is knocking in the final year of divisions in this conference. No doubt about it. One other comment about Illinois. They do have another wild card by the name of Jim Leonard. Very you know, true. that's an outstanding football coach that's going to be a great resource to them, I'm sure. Um, and, of course, they, they played outstanding defense last year. And I know people would say, well, that defensive coordinator is no longer there. Well, let's not forget that Brett Bielema has always coached defense. And now he's back with Jim Leonard. And I don't I don't even know who the new defense is. He's going to get a lot of assists from Jim Leonard and Brett Bielema. And that's going to leave him, I'm sure, with another outstanding defensive unit. All right, Don, let's get some thoughts from you uh, regarding Utah State. And, again, I'll be coming out with a 10-minute preview or so uh, in the next day or so. But uh, the Aggies, again, were not great last year. You mentioned their dual threat at quarterback. Um, what else does Utah State pose as a challenge to uh, – let's start with Iowa's offense. What does Utah State do defensively that you think Iowa is looking at at this point in the week? You know, I think they uh, – first off, they only have nine returning starters – on offense, five on defense. Uh, but understand this, 53 newcomers to the program. 23 of those are high school kids, but that leaves 10 four-year transfers, transfers from four-year schools, 20 junior college players. So there's a lot of people that are going to be playing against us on Saturday, and we don't even know much about them, if anything. Um, so uh, you talk about um, – competitive situation there are a lot of jobs up for grabs and some of those guys i'm sure those 30 older players that have come out of junior college or other four-year schools are going to figure in in a major way um they do they're picked eighth in the conference uh out of 12 teams but what you got to realize there's some pretty good names in in that league uh you got people like boise and san diego state not to mention um uh, San Jose State, who looked, who scored some points on USC over the weekend. Yeah, you're right. Uh, the teams behind them in the rankings are UNLV, Hawaii. What what happened with Hawaii and Vanderbilt? Vanderbilt ended up winning. Close one, but Vanderbilt yeah. pulled it out. Yeah. Yeah. So, and then Nevada. Uh, Nevada's listed 11th in the league. Well, you know, we played Nevada just a year ago. It's a it's a stiffer test than Nevada, you might say. Then last but not least, New Mexico. Here's the thing that surprised me, because I knew they were 6-7 and seven last year. They're one of those teams that didn't have a winning season. What I didn't realize at the time, the year before, they were 11-3. Right. Uh, and that coach, incidentally, that coach has got a history of being successful. Uh, six years as the head coach at Arkansas State. He was the head coach for seven years. The last six of which, six consecutive winning seasons, six consecutive bowl games, uh, and then 11 games in year one just two years ago at, at Utah State. Uh, incidentally, he was voted as the the uh, Region 5 AFCA Coach of the Year. That's a distinct honor. There aren't that many regions in the country, and to do it at the FBS level is a big deal. To do it at any level is a big deal. Uh, and then last but not least, he was not the offensive coordinator and quarterback coach a year ago, but as a result of the disappointing season last year, he has assumed those duties. Those are duties he had at Arkansas State, uh, duties he's had in the past. He is more than capable of coaching quarterbacks and coordinating an offense. I know you would argue that's a lot for a head coach to do, but he certainly wasn't satisfied with the way it was done a year ago. So his solution is I'm the guy in charge now on offense. And I don't doubt that he's going to present some problems for us. I've already mentioned the quarterbacks and dual threat. He threw for 61% last year. 
Uh, he ended up starting in eight games, playing in 10. He also ran for 300 plus yards. So he does have the capacity to extend plays. And uh, I'm sure we're going to think twice about about deploying to play pass and spread formations, realizing that he might be a very above average runner. So that'll be a little bit of a dilemma for us on Saturday. What do we do? Do we defend run or defend pass? Um, Blake Anderson's a good coach. He is, he is a very capable coach. Incidentally, you'll find this interesting. This will bring a smile to your face, Corey. I, I would almost fell out of my chair when I read this. Coach Anderson played – and graduated from high school in a little town called Hubbard in Texas. That's 23 miles away from my hometown. And, yes, as a high school kid, I played against the Hubbard Jaguars. That's one thing our coach that, that that coach has in common with me. He grew up in a small town in Texas, but he's had a good coaching career, and I'm sure he would tell you he's not nearly, nearly done with what he's going to do. So he's got an impressive – Resume, getting back to the game itself, looking at the stats a year ago, Corey, uh, talking about how we match up against them with our offense. Their defense is suspect. They, they've they given up any number of rushing yards. They gave up 194 a game last year. They only rushed for 159. I think a good goal for us would be to outrush them by 100 yards on Saturday. I don't know if we can do it, but if we don't outrush them by at least 50 yards, shame on us. Because their schedule last year, the opponent outrushed them by 35 yards a game, and we're certainly better than the average opponent they saw a year ago. Uh, turnover margin is another factor. They were they're a, they were nine on turnovers versus their opponents last year. They threw 21 picks compared uh, to the opponents only throwing 11 picks. So the differential on turnovers was primarily because of interceptions. The bad news for us. Uh, the other quarterback or quarterbacks apparently were a little more turnover uh, turnover guilty than the, re- the returning starter. Number five, Cooper Legas, I think it's pronounced. Uh, he threw 11 TDs. He had 10 interceptions. So he protected the ball a little bit better than the other. His interceptions, of course, were all eight of us. So I'm sure they're going to try to protect the ball against us. Uh, everybody tries to protect the ball against us. We're good at winning on turnovers. I'd be very disappointed if we don't, if we're not at least plus one, if not plus two on turnovers. I'd be very disappointed if we don't outrush them by at least 50 yards. That alone should give us um, give us a good chance to have a convincing win on Saturday. Not to mention a Kenny crowd of 70,000. I think that might help out a little bit too. Incidentally, Corey, you might not be aware, a year ago this Saturday, on September 3rd, they played at Alabama. The final was 55 to nothing. I, I remember that. I remember but that. A few, a few weeks later, they went to BYU and played them tough. So I think they, they were maybe in awe of Ohio, of um, Alabama. I'm not sh- sure that they're going to be quite as much in awe of us as number five Alabama last year, number five at the time. Don, you're, you're, at, our, you're at every season opener. Um, I haven't been at a season opener since 20 – boy, I don't think I've been at a season opener since 2017 against Wyoming. Yep. Like, ni- if it's 93 – I've been at hot games in September, don't get me wrong, but I'm just curious, where does that rank for you? Is it normally that hot? That's above average temperature, no doubt. <laughs> I, I don't like that. I, that, that, that. It doesn't sound good. You know, I'm afraid uh, – I know my wife's already warned me if the heat gets to me then I hope you're prepared for me to go back to the car and drive it home, and I'll pick you up after the game. Incidentally, Corey, we have that same uh, wonderful gesture on the part of friends of ours that are going to allow us to park in their driveway not too far from the stadium. That's going to give me a chance to start the post-game show without any difficulty at all an hour after the game, just as we did a year ago. Well, I appreciate that, Don. And uh, we should have called this Don Patterson's delineated thoughts or Don Patterson's not dilapidated thoughts. We, we got to think of a better name. This is not I, it, podcast is always better when you do most of the talking Don. So uh, I, I, I disagree. I, I hope people have enjoyed the last hour and 15 minutes. And uh, I, I just, it's, I come to this time every year, Don, and I'm like, it doesn't feel like it's week one. <laughs> it, just, it just does not feel like it. Do you get that same thing? You coach them. You, you have, almost live and lived and breathed 
the game of football for a game of college football for such a long time. Do you get where I'm coming from when I say it almost doesn't feel like we're here? The only reason you feel that way, Corey, is you didn't go through fall camp. If you've been out there practicing every day, I promise you those players are ready to play against someone else. Fair enough. Other than, other than themselves. Yeah. So I'm, um, you know, good teams. Obviously, we don't know for sure what we're going to see. Incidentally, they do have a, a new defensive coordinator also. So we might get surprised by alignments. Um, it's just guesswork as to how they're going to line up. I'm sure we don't know for sure what we're going to get. But we'll adjust during the game. That's what good teams do. Um, and we'll we'll uh, adjust to a different play caller than last year if the head coach didn't call plays a year ago. It sounds like he didn't. Um, but the thing you know about good football teams, we have veteran coaches. Uh, they're going to do a good job of not beating themselves. Incidentally, that's a category that we did shine in this past year. You're very familiar with the term positive exception and negative exception. Our listeners don't understand what that means. But basically, as you look at the games, the obvious question is the team that won most of the parameters, didn't they win the game? Shouldn't they win the game? And the answer is yes, they should. But sometimes teams are negative exceptions. They did enough to win the game and somehow managed to find a way to lose it. Uh, Our history is that we find a way to win games. I'll give you one prime example from a year ago. As you know, Minnesota outrushed us by maybe almost 200 yards in that game. They won 10 parameters out of the top 15 parameters in that game. Final score, Iowa 13, Minnesota 10. Didn't that also PJ's, happen in 2021? PJ's trying to figure out how that happens. <laughs> that happened but two I'm years pretty, in a row. I'm pretty sure Kirk's not going to divulge the answer to that. Uh, seriously, PJ knows what the answer is. The answer is we find a way to win those parameters that are maybe – even more important than outrushing your opponent. There aren't many that fit into that category, but if you win the right combination of those parameters, you can still find a way to win the game. And that's what we did against Minnesota a year ago. Um, I'm confident we're going to find a way to beat people that we're not supposed to beat, not based on the, on the point spread, but based on the way the parameters play out. We did it a year ago. We did it in two games, actually. There were two games that, that, uh, that were high on the list. And believe it or not, uh, Rutgers won any number of parameters against us a year ago. But that's a little misleading because we had, um, as I recall, we might have had a defensive score in that game. I I can't remember two of them. Okay, that explains <laughs> a lot. Thank you. Um, you know, it's, um, and another prime example, of course, is Kentucky. Uh, you know, thankfully, we didn't have to ask Joey Labus to do too much because the defense – made two touchdowns. And so um, at that point, unless Kentucky can pile up a bunch of points, it's not going to matter what the offense does. The offense did a good job protecting the ball. I think we won that parameter also in that bowl game. And uh, that led to a 21 nothing routine win. That's what good teams do. They capitalize on the other team's mistakes. We've done a good job of that. I suspect we'll be able to say that at the end of the season also. Well, Don, we're going to have many more of these discussions. In case anybody missed it, that's been scrolling across the bottom of the screen throughout this show. Uh, Myself and Coach Don Patterson will be live following all the Hawkeye games again this season, going into our third season of Iowa postgame with Coach Don Patterson. And, uh, (laughs) Don, you never know what's going to happen (laughs) in those shows. And so I have always said that's why people pay good money to watch, they don't know what's going to happen. Well, they don't pay good money to watch our show, but they pay good money to watch football. <laughs> but we'll we'll uh, we'll look forward to another year of not only Hawkeye football. I look forward to being able to chat with with you. It's one of the bright spots of Saturday. Uh, if I'm not able to watch the rest of college football that day, I'd rather be talking with you, Don, about Iowa football and talking with Hawkeye fans on this platform. So encourage everybody to be live with us following the games, including after the Iowa Utah State game. We'll be taking calls, taking chats, taking questions, etc. And you can join even by video if you so choose. Don, again, it's been a pleasure over the last hour, hour and 15 minutes. But uh, we're going to be talking real soon. Thank you for taking the time. And uh, we'll talk to you Saturday. Always a pleasure, Corey. Go Hawks. All right, folks. For Coach John Patterson, I'm Corey Bratta. You've been watching week 225 of Bratta's Branded Thoughts from the Hawkeye of the Storm. More coverage the rest of the week, including myself and Brad Heinrichs of the Swarm Live for a show Wednesday evening. And more stuff, keep it locked right here from the Hawkeye of the Storm on YouTube. We'll talk to you soon.